Okay. Mic check. One.
Good evening. Welcome to Bible study. I will pray and we shall begin. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity we have to gather together to hear your word, to learn and grow in the scriptures. And we look forward to what will be revealed this evening. Holy Spirit, as always, have your way. You know what needs to be said and heard. You are the revealer of truth, our counselor, our lead, our guide, our help. Illuminate the scriptures for us this evening. And I know you'll see to it that the word goes forth with clarity, unhindered, and unchecked by any unseen or opposing forces because those forces have been defeated as a result of Christ's finished work at Calvary. And it's in that finished work that we do rest where we have entered into your rest, Father, and there we remain. And where we remain is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Every care, every burden, all heaviness, by faith, by faith, we can give it all to you and exchange, receive your peace, your peace that surpasses all understanding, guarding our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And we thank you that every need is met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, that we walk in the fullness of your blessing, your shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, prospering in every aspect of our lives as our soul prospers. And we thank you that that prosperity includes physical prosperity or healing. We thank you that you sent your word and healed us. And by his stripes, we were healed. He took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses according to your word. It is done. It is settled. It is finished. So we thank you for your covenant names, that you are Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh, and Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our peace, the Lord our provider, and the Lord our healer. Now, Father, I thank you that the hearts this evening, those watching, those listening, they are prepared. The soil is rich. The seed of the word will be sown, and it will produce in their hearts and be seen in their lives, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, honor, adoration, and thanksgiving in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay. Let's make our way to Revelation 21. Yeah, Revelation 21, of course, something we have gone over during our end time message, our message on Revelation as well as the book of Daniel. And so what we're going to do here is go over the description of this city verse by verse. And what we're going to learn is that a lot of what we have thought about heaven a lot of the ways in which heaven ha has been described to us is actually the description of the city, which is just a small piece of heaven. So here, Revelation 21, this is right after the great white throne judgment. So in chapter 20, we read, well, the end of 19, uh, the the armies of, of, of the beasts uh, submit to the uh, armies of the Lord, uh, the false prophet and the beast are cast into the lake of fire alive. And then chapter 20, the devil, of course, is cast into, this, into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. We know then that the saints, those who participate in the first resurrection, which of course comes in two parts, the martyrs will be the second part. The first part or first half of the first resurrection is the rapturing or the catching away of the church at the Lord's epiphany of his appearing. And so that reign for a thousand years will coincide with the devil in prison for a thousand years in, in the bottomless pit. And so Christ is setting up his millennial kingdom or he will set up his millennial kingdom and we will reign with him as kings and priests. And then we read about his release. The adversary's release that is for a short time. He goes out to do what he does best, that is to deceive Fire rains down from heaven once he and his army surround the camp of the saints. They are devoured. The devil tossed into the lake of fire. His armies tossed into the lake of fire. And then death in Hades. We make our, our way to the great white throne judgment and we know books are open and these are the books of the deeds of those judged at the great white throne judgment. And there's an additional book, the Lamb's Book of Life. Whoever's name is not found written in that book will be tossed into the lake of fire. Uh, death and Hades give up the dead in them 
and then they're tossed into the lake of fire. And that is the end of God's adversaries. That is what John saw. And then this is what he saw next here in Revelation 21. And we're going to begin with verse 1. Now, it reads that I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So John does not see the sea. There's no more sea. Uh, and this is one of the oldest Greek words. As a matter of fact, one of the oldest aquatic deities in Greek mythology went by the name of Thalassa. And that is the Greek word here, Thalassa, one who was actually before even Poseidon. And so, so this word is referring to the sea. John is saying that there was no more sea. But notice he says, new heaven, new earth. And then he says, the former heaven and the former earth had passed away. And he calls them the, the first heaven and the first earth. Uh, in this case, he's not saying first heaven to distinguish from second heaven and third heaven. He's saying first heaven as in the first version or first iteration or whatever was there previously. Now, one of the things that we know about the earth, because we want to make sure that we have a proper understanding of what we're reading here, new earth, first earth had passed away. If the first earth has passed away, is John saying that he literally witnessed the, the whether it's an eradication, elimination, disappearance, is he saying that he literally witnessed the first earth? Because, of course, this is the vision of all things coming to an end. Is John saying that he saw the first earth no more? Like he, he witnessed it gone, never to be again. And then what followed or replaced it was this new earth. Is that what John is saying? And is he saying the same thing about heaven? No, that's not what he's saying. Because if that is what he's saying, then the Bible is contradicting itself. And we know that is not the case. Throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, we read that the earth will always remain. The earth will always be. The earth will not come to an end. So what is John saying when he says that he sees or saw a new earth for the first earth had passed away, and of course he says the same thing about heaven. Now, if earth, in fact, is a copy, a sense realm or physical realm copy of heaven, then the same would have to be regarding heaven, that heaven will always remain. So what is John saying here when he says, I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth? Well, what we can do is liken it to the salvation experience, the salvation process. Okay, when we get born again, and Paul talks about the old man and the new man, well, what is he talking about? Well, when he's talking about the old man, he's talking about the sinful nature. He's talking about the new man. He's talking about the righteous nature. But, but when we get born again, you know, we're born into this world, uh, spiritually dead. We're, we're born into sin. We are in need of salvation. We need to be born again. So when the message of salvation is preached by the preacher, we hear it, faith comes, we respond to the invitation. So, so I come into this world spiritually dead. I come into this world born into sin, in need of a savior, in need of the new birth. And when that new birth happens, here's what God doesn't do. God does not reach into my flesh because salvation, the first part is, is the spiritual reconnection to the father. That is the, the immediate, just like spiritual death was, uh, uh instant, a spiritual rebirth is instant. So your spirit man immediately reconnects to the power source, and that is God. So here's what God doesn't do. God does not reach into your unsafe flesh, pull out that separated spirit from him, cause it to exist no more, and then put in place of that old spirit in that unsafe flesh a brand new spirit. That's not what he does. God does what? God makes the spirit new. That spirit that is on the inside of our flesh, when we get born again, our spirits are made new. And the same thing will happen to our bodies. 
when we pass away, our bodies go back to the earth from which it came unless we are a part of the generation that will witness the appearing of the Lord, the generation who will be alive when the Lord appears. That generation will not see death. But all previous generations, their bodies will have gone back to the earth from which it came. Now, Jesus said, I am the resurrection, and the New Testament would go on to speak about the, the resurrection of the saints. When the saints are resurrected, is it that God obliterates the old body and gives them a new body? No, he makes the body new. That's the business God is in. God makes things new. We'll see that in verse 5. So, so when I get born again, he makes my spirit new. My soul is being made new. By the time I'm ready to be housed in a new body, my soul is made new. And spirit and soul made new will be placed or housed in flesh made new. Right? Not new flesh. Flesh that didn't exist before. It's the same flesh. It's just made new. That is the resurrection. If, 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 if that wasn't the case, then the wounds would not have remained in the resurrected body of our Messiah. So it's the, it's the same flesh resurrected and once glorified will no longer uh, be subject to the, uh, uh, will no longer be subject to the limitations of the previous state of the body. So when John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, what's he saying? I saw heaven made new. I saw the earth made new. Same earth made new. Same heaven made new. Same you made new. That's how God operates. Okay, verse two. He says, then here's what I saw. Then I, John, I saw the holy city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John said he saw the city prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. He said he saw a city, a holy city, and its name was New Jerusalem. Once again, coming down out of heaven. John did not say New Jerusalem was heaven. He said, New Jerusalem was coming down out of heaven. This is an actual city. Verse 3, and he says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven. My goodness, the distance between earth and heaven is vast. How was John able to hear a voice from heaven? Is it because the voice was so powerful it could be heard from heaven? Or was that voice, that sound sent through portal or whirlwind? And then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tent, the habitation of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. All right, let's look at, 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 at uh, the mention of this three times in this third verse. The tabernacle of God is what? With men. He will dwell with them. God himself will be with them. All right, did you notice? And this is the very end. This is the very end when it's all said and done. This is how it ends. Notice that John did not say, men are with the tabernacle of God. We will dwell with him. We will be with him. That's not what John says. John says the tent, the habitation of God, the abode. Isaiah talks about his holy habitation. The house of God is the abode of God. Look at what, what John is telling us here. This is what he saw. He said the, the habitation of God is with men. God's going to dwell with us. God's going to be with us. Now remember in the very beginning when there was no sin in the world, and we're going to talk about this next week. I had hoped to get to it tonight, but I think it's too much for tonight. I, I need to go over some more things. We're, we're going to get into, in, into uh, a number of different religious, oral religious views of the heavens. The Islamic view of heaven, where, where, where does that come from? What's that rooted in? 
And then, of course, the Jewish view of heaven, which consists of seven heavens according not to the law of Moses. We don't see that, although there are some scriptures we see that, uh, that are worded in a very unique way designating heaven. But the Talmud talks about seven heavens. And, and for about five of those seven heavens, there are some scriptural references in the Old Covenant um, that are mentioned. And, and, and we'll look at these things and we'll talk about the state of the, the earth or paradise where Eden was, where the man was placed to, to tend and keep the garden. We'll talk about what that state was. You know, what, what was, was, was that the earth uh, as we know it? Was it the earth on a higher plane or was it the same earth in a pre-sin, uh, 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 flawless and perfect uh, state or mode? So we'll, we'll look into all of that. But what we see here is that God's going to do what he did in the beginning. Uh, in the very beginning when he created man, he created man a living nepez in the Hebrew, a living creature. And uh, he never told man or commanded man to die. That was not a part of man's assignment. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Um, yeah, there's nothing in Genesis about man dying. That, that wasn't God's ordained plan for man to die. And yet, what happens? Well, man disobeys God. God already gave him the heads up. And the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. Immediately, man was cut off from God spiritually. And Adam began to what? He began to die progressively. Now, he lived a long time, 930 years. There's a lot someone can do in 930 years of life. But it's still sad because he died. And that was not God's original plan. And so if man, if man was not created to die, and if man does not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and therefore does not die, then man never sees heaven, which tells us man was not created for heaven. The celestials were created for a celestial place. The Terrans were created for a terrestrial place, and that is the earth. So Adam never sins. Adam never dies. Man never dies. Man doesn't see heaven as a result of dying. In which 2 Corinthians 5 tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As long as we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And the Bible also tells us that once Adam sinned and he hid himself, he could hear the sound of God walking throughout the garden. That tells me that was a regular thing for God to walk with his children in the garden. So what's going to happen in the very end? Well, we started off. Now we know this. Watch this. James says, God is the father of spirits. And, and, and while he is the creator of flesh, he deemed Adam the father of flesh. In other words, I, the father of spirits, um, um, will, will place spirits in the homes you build, Adam, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. So, so in the very beginning, God is with his children in their house, leaving his abode to come to the abode he created for them. It appears that in, in the very end, not only is he going to leave his abode and come to our abode, he's going to make his abode with our abode or in our abode. Or he's going to make his abode our abode. The tabernacle of God, the habitation of God is with men. And God's going to dwell, live, or not just visit, but he's going to dwell with them. So it appears that what we're seeing is, is the Garden of Eden pre-sin upgraded. Okay, verse 4. And what's God going to do? He's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Adam let all of this stuff in, in the very end, when it's all said and done. No more of any of this. No more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, nor, no more crying. Now, right now, if we were to pass away before the Lord appears, well, we go to be with the Lord. But that's not the final destination. Heaven is not the final destination. Heaven is the Lord's home. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, are many rooms. And then he said, I go to prepare, not a home for you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. 
Okay, so, so if we pass away before the Lord appears to receive his church, before the resurrection, if we pass away before that time, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We leave our home in the body because God created the body to be our home. He created the earth to be our home, and we go to his home. And we remain there for a period of time. Now, those of us who participate in the first part of the first resurrection, we come back with him in Revelation 19. When he's judging and making war, the parousia, the coming of the Lord, that's not a stealth mission. He's not coming like a thief in the night. He, he's coming like a thief in the night to receive his church when he appears. And we will, what? We will meet, uh, 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 we will meet the Lord in the air. That's the appearing. When he comes, his feet will touch the ground, and there's nothing stealth about it. He's making a lot of noise. He's coming to do what? Once again, judge and make war. His saints are behind him on white horses just like him. Enoch prophesied about this. Jude quotes it. Innumerable company, uh, watch this, innumerable company of saints to execute judgment on the ungodly, and with the innumerable company of saints, an, an innumerable company of angels. But until that happens, it's appointed for man to die once because of Adam's sin. But when this moment manifests, no more death. No one's dying. And where are we? According to John, we're going to be in this holy city, New Jerusalem, that comes down from heaven. Verse 5, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. There it is. Not I make all new things. I make all things new. And he said to me, write for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. Now, what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. But all work wasn't finished. Jesus was being very specific. It is finished. My work as the son of Abraham, the law of Moses, it is finished. That which is required for mankind to be redeemed, it is finished. But then there was work for the redeemed to do. So my goodness, at the end of, of, at the end of one major point in Scripture, it's finished. At the end of another one, it is done. God says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts." Now, what this sounds like. Well, let, let, let me finish. Let me finish seven and eight. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So this is a callback. That's what this is. Verse six, verses six, seven, and eight. Because once the whole, once, once New Jerusalem comes down, and, and we know that this happens next because when you read the last verse of chapter 20, which is verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book was cast into the lake, what does John say next? He says, now, now I saw a new heaven. So verses 6, 7, and 8 are a call back to what? A call back to salvation, believing in the Lord, and what will happen in the very end to the wicked. But what we're reading in 6, 7, and 8 actually has already happened before New Jerusalem comes down. John said it in verse 15 of chapter 20. What's he basically saying? If you want to participate in this divine occasion, this splendid event that will occur in New Jerusalem, well, you better drink of the fountain of the water of life. You better be one who overcomes because the cowardly and unbelieving, et cetera, well, they will have their part in the lake, which is the second death. Verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That seems pretty clear to me. Come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. 
Now, we've heard that the church is the bride of Christ. Seems like the angel should show John the church. Now, I have said this before, that if the church is the bride, the church is not the bride as the church. The, the function of church would have to come to a close, which it will when the church's harpazu, rapturo, caught up. That'll come to a close. The ecclesia, the community of believers. <laughs> These buildings that we call churches, they'll still be here when we're out of here, when we're snatched up. But the ecclesia, the, 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 the body of Christ that is the church, that comes to a close at the Lord's appearing. So, and John was a part of that church. It's an apostle of the Lamb. He's writing to the church. So, so you would think then that if in fact what we have traditionally been taught that the church is the bride of Christ, it would seem that this angel would do what? That this angel would show John the church. But he doesn't show him the church. All right, let's keep reading. Come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Is this city so large that it's still descending here in verse 10? And we're going to read how large it is in a second. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her light, her, was like a most precious stone. The city has the glory of God and her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, like the sea of glass, John and Ezekiel describe. Also, she, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them which are names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, we know who those tribes are from the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 sons of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. We get a little more detail from one of the Old Testament prophets, Ezekiel, in chapter 48, verses 30 through 35. He elaborates on this as well. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll read it next week. Uh, verse 14. Now, now, mind you, remember, verse 9, the angel says, Come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And then he shows him a city, a city called New Jerusalem. Now, a couple things to consider. For example, Israel, in which her capital was Jerusalem. Israel was considered, uh, in, in some figurative language in the Old Testament, the wife of God. Uh, and he wasn't talking about the state of Israel. He was talking about the people in, in which he had a covenant with. But yet here he's talking about a city, New Jerusalem. And the city that John is describing in this present moment, which is every time we read it, he's describing an empty city. Because some say, oh, well, well, the church will dwell. Yeah, the church will dwell. But in this very moment, John's not seeing all believers in the Lord in the city, John is seeing the city in which all believers in the Lord will dwell. So he describes her light and that and how she had a great and high wall. Twelve angels, twelve gates, twelve angels at the gates. The names written, twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. Verse 14, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Were the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Well, 
Jesus called 12 during his earthly ministry. Now, here's where it's going to get interesting. Because that's what the word does. It always gets more interesting and interesting on top of interesting. The gifts and callings of God are what? Irrevocable? Okay. So what do we do in the case of Judas, who was known as a son of perdition, but who died in a state of remorse? In Acts 1, when lots were cast, Matthias was chosen to replace him. What say you, family? Of the 12 apostles, whose names are what? Are written on the 12 foundations of this city. Do we find the name of Judas or the name of Matthias? Nevertheless, this is one of the reasons that it's believed the 24 elders consist of the 12 sons of Israel and the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Notice their names are the only names written in the city. The 12 names of the tribes, the tribes were named after the sons, so the 12 names of the sons of Israel are on the gates, the 12 names of the apostles of the Lamb are on the foundations. And this word foundation uh, means that which is laid down of a building, could be a wall and or of a city. The 12 apostles of the Lamb, once again, are those who walked with Jesus, they witnessed his, his earthly ministry, they witnessed his death, they witnessed his resurrection, his ascension. So who's not included in this? John's included in this. John saw his name. Paul's not. Paul wasn't an apostle. He was not an apostle of the Lamb. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, like all apostles are, but Paul was not a part of this apostleship. Okay. Verse 15, it says, and he who talk, talked with me, and who is this? This is that same angel in verse 9. He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city. A gold reed, was it a, the, it, was, was it a stem that was made gold or was it already golden? And if it was already golden, then is there golden vegetation in, in heaven? Or was this was this reed made from the stem of a plant and was then made gold? That's just as awesome if that's the case. Because where did it come from? It came from heaven because the angel came from the celestial place. He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gold, uh, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. That's very biblical the fulfillment of prophecy. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. With this reed, he was a able to measure this city. Is he measuring it with one reed? The reed is as tall as the city? Or is the reed so tall for so long, it's very fitting that it could be used to measure the city? How large is this angel? could be massive. We already know they can get to be sizes beyond the tallest and highest of the kaijus and Godzilla monster films. Because we know in Revelation 10, one is so large, one foot's on the land, one foot's in the ocean. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breath. And, 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 and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. 12,000 furlongs. A furlong is a space or distance of about 600 feet. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So 12,000 furlongs high, long, and wide. 12,000 furlongs um, 
Okay. Last time I did this, I, my math might have been off because I may have wrote something incorrectly. So, uh, my friend in the back, you can, you can uh, adjust anything that I miss here. But this is what I wrote. I wrote this. Oh, gosh. My note says I wrote this in 2014. So, one furlong is 600 feet. Just, just, just yell out if I, if I did some math incorrectly. And then I need to, I'll need to adjust it in here. Anyway, one furlong is 600 feet, so 12,000 furlongs would be 7,200,000 feet. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And then that would be, right, one, about 1,363.63 miles. And if we were to, because some scholars, they just round it up to 1,500 because, you know, the, the measurements aren't always exact. For example, remember, um, a cubit could be anywhere from 18 to 22 inches. And a span is half a cubit, which would mean that the, the span would be anywhere from 9 to 11 inches. Okay, so, so most, they, they pretty much round the the. Uh, 12,000 furlongs length, width, and height to about 1,500 miles wide, high, and long. Okay, so so uh, that's the length between Los Angeles and San Antonio. All right, so imagine this, and 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 when I see it coming down, I see it coming down like a massive mothership. Okay, so so. That's the length between Los Angeles, California, and San Antonio, Texas. It's the width of Los Angeles, California, to a little past Vancouver, Canada. And the height between the earth and the outer atmosphere is somewhere between 62 and 75 miles. Now, if this is 1,500 miles, what does that tell you? This, this, this city is, you, I don't even know if your imagination can imagine it. And it's sitting on the earth made new. And, and, and as large as it is, it, it has a top, it has a peak. It still is, is, is an infinitesimal dot in the vastness of vacuum. Which is nothing compared to the size of the entirety of heaven. You name me a craftsman like God. You name me a genius like God. 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. And then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the, to the measure of a man. Well, that is, I like how this, how this reads, of an angel. I believe the word man here, right, in the Hebrew, yeah, anthropos. So it's not limited to human males only. Uh, and then... In the Hebrew, we have a, a word ish and then a word gabir. So, so and, and uh, uh, Gabriel is referred to as both. So, it's according to the height of not a mere mortal, but of celestial creatures known as angels. He measured its wall, once again, 144 cubits in like we said before, 18 to 22 inches if we go with the average and just go with 20. It's about 20 inches to each cubit. The wall is 144 cubits. Verse 18, the construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear, gas, uh, clear glass. Now, you'll notice that these precious stones are stones that we've seen in heaven Stones that we've seen in the throne room, stones that we've seen on the person of Hillel before he fell and became the devil and Satan. And once again, these descriptions, these are the descriptions that people use to describe heaven, but that's not accurate. Those descriptions aren't describing heaven. They're describing a little small piece of heaven, a city known as New Jerusalem. Look at this. The construction of its wall was of Jasper and the city was pure gold. We've limited God's architecture to streets paved with gold. Mm -mm. No, this says the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city foundations were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. 
The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the, fir- the sixth sardius, and notice it's 12, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh uh, uh, yacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Now, these are stones that we've seen in Ezekiel. These are stones that we've seen throughout the scripture. And, and these stones have come from heaven. So let's, let's consider what heaven contains. Just some mountains? I would imagine there's, there are probably clouds in heaven. But for sure, mountains. Horses. We know there are horses. There's gold in heaven. Precious stones are in heaven. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. There's, there are pearls in heaven. That's where the pearly gates comes from. There's actually nothing in scripture that describes pearly gates in heaven and Peter holding uh, the gates down. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. But we do see in this small piece of heaven, the holy city, New Jerusalem, the gates are pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Wow. Verse 22. But unlike old Jerusalem, he says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Hmm. Wait, they're the temple, so if we enter into the temple in New Jerusalem, we enter into them, they that dwell with us in that day. Like right now, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Now, it doesn't say that the sun and moon no longer exist. It just simply says the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. The glory of God illuminates this place. The lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth who are saved shall bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. That tells me that we can venture out. Because remember... This massive city does not consume the entirety of the earth. So there's plenty of earth made new to see as well. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. No night in the city? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we reading, or is it possible that we're reading that, that there will still be sun and night outside of the city? or morning and night outside of the city, and the sun and moon still function outside of the city. But in the city, the glory of God illuminates it, the Lamb is its light, and there shall be no night there. Wow. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And this is how you know John is describing a city that will be inhabited by God's people. Look at what he says in verse 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. They'll be in the lake of fire. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. They are the ones who will enter the city. And he continues to describe this city. Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water and life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. This water's in the city? Well, if this water's in the city, then this water came down from heaven. In the city that came down from heaven. And just think about it. In heaven also, before man was ever created, if we, if we do in fact believe that the sons of God 
shouted for joy and the morning stars sang. That all happened when the foundations of the earth were laid. Well, the earth was created before man and the celestials were created before the earth. And I believe God created his innumerable company of celestials, all of them. I don't believe they're coming into existence like humans enter into. As a matter of fact, knowing how God operates, every, every person that was, is, and will be born into this world, their spirits already exist. So God's created everything already in advance but the house in which the spirit would dwell within the house in which man would dwell the earth, well, the celestials and the sons of God, they were, they were shouting for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid, shouting for joy and singing. Well, some of those celestials are cherubim and seraphim. And the seraphim who roll in fours, well, one of them, their face has the likeness of a man and for the cherub who has four faces one of his faces happens to be the face of a man and not only that but the face of an ox a lion and an eagle faces four different creatures human creature uh, uh, two beasts of the field of the land and, and one beast of the air one creature of the air before the foundations of the earth were laid, before, before, before animals were created in the, in the six, first six days of creation uh, in which he rested on the seventh, and, and before man was also created on that sixth day of creation, before Adam was put into a sleep and, and beasts of the field and birds of the air were, were brought to him, also made from, according to Genesis 2, from the earth, and Adam named him. And before all of that was laid out, yeah, it was laid out in the mind of God, but before it actually came into fruition, celestials already existed, cherubim that had the faces of creatures that would later on exist in the earth. Is that because they already existed in heaven? And so here we have water, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, the tree of life. Now, it sounds to me like this is the tree of life from Eden. The tree of life, Genesis 2, 9, that was the tree that represented life and immortality. Whereas the other tree, the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil, that was mortality and death. So if this is the same tree of life, because it doesn't say a tree of life. We see scriptures between Genesis and Revelation that read a tree of life or trees of life. But this is very specific like in Genesis 2.9. This is the tree of life. It sounds to me like this is the tree of life from Eden. This description here is very paradise like this paradise within the paradise that is New Jerusalem. This description uh, 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 of, of this area in which the tree of life uh, is found is very specific, and this is a definite article here, so I'm thinking this must be the tree of life, and if in fact it is, that begs the question, where did it go? Because man had to be driven out of the garden, lest they take from the tree of life and live forever in their sin, because that's what the tree represented. The fruit of that tree was life and immortality, so salvation wouldn't have been able to fix that. That would have been an, been an eternal sinful state. He had to drive man out of the garden. Okay, so our gears are turning now. The tree of life remained there, covered by cherubim, plural. And as mankind continued to fall into degradation, it, it prevented us from seeing, seeing it. it it's, it's still there, which would be somewhere in Mesopotamia. Is it somewhere in Mesopotamia that can't be seen? Of course, Mesopotamia isn't Mesopotamia today. But if we went to the Fertile Crescent, which consisted of many of the territories that we, we studied in, in our uh, uh, race division and racism lesson and any lesson that has to do with the Table of Nations, which I want to do another one of those very soon. Um, 
so so was it in some space was and is in some space in which it can't be seen because of sin did it ascend at some point was it carried up by celestials or was the tree of life in an Eden that was in a higher state of earth, not quite heaven, but above what we exist in now? My thinking is that New Jerusalem comes down where old Jerusalem is. And if so, here's the tree of life right there. In, but of course, when it comes down in that location, it's going to also cover the Fertile Crescent, the, the, all of the Levant. So the tree of life could end up being in the same place it was in the Garden of Eden. But notice, it says, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river. Are we reading here that there's only one street in this city? It doesn't read in the middle of a street. It's not that clear. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits. Each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I asked the question before, in this state of the world, why would anything or anyone need healing? And then it makes sense. This is for those who did not participate in the first resurrection. They're going to need that healing. It says, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. And that's it. That is the description of the city. That's the final description in Revelation. This is the last thing that will be seen and done. Everything else in Revelation, verses 6 all the way to verse 21. Final exhortations, admonitions, warnings, and a, and, and a testament of him coming quickly. That's what it is. So, this is how it ends. And once again, the, the gates that are pearls, the street that is gold, the city that is gold, all of the precious stones, this comes down out of heaven onto the earth made new. Out of the heaven or heavens made new. Onto the earth made new. What a description of the city. So next week we'll, we'll get into, we're going to get into uh, different cultures and, and mythologies, views of heaven, where some of those come from, how much of that may be rooted in the Hebrew view of heaven. And of course, we'll talk about the seven heavens uh, mentioned in the Talmud and, and we'll see where else this this goes. Much more to talk about regarding heaven than there is uh, hell. Father, we thank you for your word. It's, it's life and truth. It will not. It, it cannot return to you void, but it will accomplish what it set out to do and it will prosper in that which it was sent. And I thank you indeed that the seed of the word has gone forth, that which is incorruptible. It has been planted into the hearts of those watching and listening. And Father, I thank you that uh, it will produce because your word be accomplishes where it's sent and prospers in what it's sent. And so it's prospering uh, in their hearts and it will, it will produce in their hearts and be seen in their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the invitations I'll mention in just a moment available to the people, those watching and listening right now. Uh, if you do not know Christ, you can know him. Listen, if you want to secure your spot, make your reservation for residency in New Jerusalem, you can do that right now. All of us in this room, we, we, we've already done that. And many watching online have already done that. So we want you to, we want you to join in the fun with us. Um, so if you don't know Christ, you can know him tonight. If, you, if you've never been filled with the Spirit, that is the only way to live the life of service that we've been called to live. Once we're born again, we must be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit isn't necessary to see God or necessary to see heaven when you pass away or necessary to see the holy city, but it is necessary for service and necessary to be a witness. So if you don't know Jesus, you can know him tonight. It begins with this confession of faith. Simply repeat after me saying, Dear God, 
you said in your word, if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you've raised him from the dead, I would be saved. You said whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Well, on this day, I do now confess and I do now believe that he is Lord, that he took away the sin of the world and that you raised him from the dead. I'm now a part of his church, his body, uh, his kingdom, uh, uh, his family. He is my savior and Lord and my head and king. I am your child. You are my father and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, simply repeat after me, saying, Heavenly Father, I see in your word, the early church, the first disciples, whom did not go forth, preaching the kingdom until they received power from heaven. They were filled with the Spirit. They spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, like them on that day, by faith. I received the gift of the Spirit. I am now filled with the Spirit. And I too have received my heavenly language. And most importantly, I'm now a witness for the king and for the kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. If you've prayed these prayers or either of these for the very first time, praise God, you're in the family of God, filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You may wonder what's next. Where do I go from here? If you have those questions, you can reach out to us by way of the email address you see on the screen. You can also reach out uh, and connect with us if you're interested in becoming a part of the Crenshaw and Ever Increasing Faith family. And now it's time to give. It is time to sow. It is time to reap because reaping follows sowing. The harvest follows the seed. And so... Uh, how do we give? Cheerfully. It's the only way to do it. If you're not giving cheerfully, do not give. You're wasting your time and God's time. God loves a cheerful, happy, and hilarious giver. And, and how we give or sow is how we receive or reap. Whatever a man sows, so shall he reap. Uh, and we'll reap in due season if we faint not and do not lose heart. The measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. Many ways that you can sow, many ways that you can give. You can text to give right there on your smart devices or by way of the website or our app. You can also call the ministry or our 24-hour uh, call center. You can give by way of cash. Our tag is right there, dollar sign, Crenshaw Christian CTR, and by way of Alexa devices. So if you are ready to give, let's lift our gifts up to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. He'll take them, worship the Father on our behalf. I will pray. Father, we thank you for your word on giving. We thank you that we are your fellow workers, workers together with you, the laborers going forth into the plentiful harvest. We counted both an honor and a privilege to do so and to be just that. And we thank you that we get to take the message of your son, the message of our living Savior, and see to it that that message goes forth into this dying world. Our giving contributes to that as senders or goers. We are um, going into, into the harvest where the souls are. And so I thank you that as we give this evening according to what we have, as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully, and we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Father, we thank you for your healing power. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. We thank you for those who are no longer experiencing pain, for those who have received their healing, for those who have experienced their deliverance. The pain is gone. The heaviness has lifted. We shout hallelujah. We rejoice with them, but we also continue to stand in faith those who have yet to see the manifestation of what they prayed for. For if, in fact, they believed they received when we prayed, then they will have. And we know this to be truth because your word says that if we pray according to your will, you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, we know we have the petitions we've asked of you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Before we get into Q&A, and, &A, and, and uh, uh, for those who will depart now, or in, in a few seconds before Q&A begins. Information on our blood drives and the prayer line can be found on any of our social media pages. Don't forget, Sunday service, May 22nd, 1030 a.m. in person or online if you were with us uh, this past Sunday. Um, 
and you stayed all the way through, then you heard the announcement that I made afterward. Uh, I have removed the mask requirement, so you are no longer required to wear a mask when you attend service. Uh, if you'd like to keep your mask on, not a problem. Uh, there's no issue there, so whatever works best for you, whatever makes you most comfortable, and make sure that you make others around you comfortable as well. Uh, until then, continue to have the best week of your life in the name of the Lord Jesus. Those who are departing now, God's grace be on you. Uh, his divine protection be on you, and we will see you online or in person Sunday. The rest who will remain, Q&A begins right now. Pastor, uh, women who have had abortions and are now serving the Lord, can they still inherit the fullness of God's kingdom? Will you please share your wisdom on this? Absolutely they can. Uh, any error or trespass uh, is forgotten. It, it, if you're past it, uh, and, I have to, and I have to word it like that because first off, we always must remember that, that we are constantly in forgiveness. We, 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 we walk in it, we sleep in it, we sing in it, we eat in it. I mean, when we get saved, we enter into the divine forgiveness of the Father. And the Bible says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, well, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I am constantly walking in the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, as long as I'm walking in the light. Now, if I err, John wrote to believers, he said, my little children, I write to you so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, well, guess what we have? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, the appeasing for our sins, those of us who are children of God, and the world as well. So if you, and this is not limited to, to abortions, uh, but using your, your particular wording, had abortions and are now serving the Lord, can they still inherit the fullness of God's kingdom? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because every heir confess to our father. Once that happens, he doesn't know what you're talking about anymore. And that's why it's so important for us to not allow the adversary to bring up our heirs. Because God, God has no idea of what we're talking about. That's how powerful he is. He chooses to forget. And that, that is wiped off away and out of the record. Hi, Pastor. Apart from praising our great God, what else would be our roles in the new Jerusalem? I, th I, I, I'm definitely, when you say roles, um, I don't know. Um, we could probably, but then I, that's not completely apples to apples because we're going to reign as kings and priests. Well, we know we're reigning as kings and priests during the thousand year reign but you know what wait a minute no didn't i just read it in verse five yeah they shall reign forever and ever yeah they shall see his face yeah this is talking about we just read it in revelation 22 his servants shall serve him they shall see his face his name shall be on their foreheads they shall reign forever and ever so we know we're reigning we know that's a part of it I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll be allowed to choose roles. I would, I would choose security, but there's nothing to, to guard or protect. There's no evil, not according to Revelation. There will be no more evil once, once death and Hades are in the lake of fire and all whose names are not written in the book are in the lake of fire. That pretty much seems to be it. So what else would our roles be? I don't know. I want to do a lot of exploring. That's what I'm looking forward to. But I don't know if we're even going to do that. What if, what if we're, what if we are, I mean, we're talking about God who's infinite. So we could be basking in his glory the entire time. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's going to be better than anything we could experience now. And, and I guarantee you we're, we're all going to be okay with it. But, but me, of course, I, I, just, I want to know about the cosmos. I want to try and understand as much as I possibly can. 
So I'm hoping that there's an opportunity for that. Pastor, do you think the city that comes down out of heaven is where the saints are now and the city is what Jesus was talking about when he said he was going to prepare a place for us or in the city only for the end time? I believe that. Um, yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, can I prove it? I can't technically prove it, but I do believe that that is, I believe that's the place. Um, you know, he said in my father's house, so we know heaven is the abode of God, but then if the Bible is also saying the habitation, habitation of God will be with men on the earth, well, it's got to be some place that has many mansions, and the description of New Jerusalem would have plenty of those for all his beloved to be housed in. So that's what I believe. Um, but I mean, I guess it's, it's possible that right now every saint who's in heaven experiencing the glory of heaven could be somewhere where the holy city isn't. I mean, heaven's massive. It's bigger than the universe. So that's a possibility. But I, I, I believe it's what you, you asked. I believe that's what it is. There are teachings, hello pastor, there are teachings on heaven which state that the glory of God illuminates uh, his throne as one continual, continual day, no night. If that is the case, is it reasonable to accept that the entire cosmos and not just New Jerusalem would have continual daylight due to his glory? Hmm. That depends on if, I mean, if his throne is in New Jerusalem, I think we could still make a case that this, that, that what we read about no need for the sun, moon, and night could just be relegated to New Jerusalem. But that could just be the case. I, once again, I may not be completely accurate uh, in that. So it, it, it could be the, it could be that the entire cosmos uh, would be illuminated by his glory, but but what John is recording seems to be specific to New Jerusalem. I don't rule it out, what you're saying. That could be the case. Um, I'm thinking that, that the glory of God illuminating his throne is, is, is his throne since, since they are the temple. The Godhead is the temple. So I'm thinking his, his throne in New Jerusalem is what's illuminated by his own glory. But... I mean, we're talking about God here. We can't, we can't put God in a box, that's for sure. And we can't measure him with, with the instruments we use to measure things and quantify things in this realm. Hey, Pastor, in More Than Conquerors, an interpretation of the book of Revelation by William Hendrickson, he says the term a tree of life is collective just like avenue or river. Okay, and there are many trees of life with fruit that can be eaten. Your thoughts? Well, many trees of life are mentioned, uh, and, and let's see. Let's go back to Revelation 22 real quick. See if I missed anything. Okay, yes, it only talks about one tree, but let's take a look at Genesis 2:9. Hmm. Yeah. So they both only. They read the same way, the tree of life. Uh, so it, it appears it could be referring to the same tree, but, but uh, Mr. Hendrickson could definitely be, be right because trees of life are mentioned in between Genesis and Revelation uh, in the Old Covenant. So that could be the case that there are many trees of life. There actually may be a version of Scripture that makes it plural. Is there? Oh, it does. You're right. See? Yeah, each tree. That's right. I remember. Uh, see, now I overlooked that one this time. Was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits. This was another one of those scriptures that at one point it, it baffled me, but it does read. Each tree yielding its fruit every month. Hmm. Now, tree is in italics, so it wasn't in the original writing but normally when italicized words are added it is to make the thought or or sentence more complete and understandable in our language 
So if tree is implied here, then, then we do see multiple trees here. So good observation, saints. What are some of my good works? Well, my good works are no different than anyone else's good works. I mean, I don't have my own good works. So I want to be, I want to be sure that what I think is good is acceptable in God's sight. Um, I mean, giving, for example, like giving to the poor, uh, v- visiting those imprisoned, uh, visiting the sick, healing the sick, laying hands on the sick, praying for people, um, caring for others, housing others, uh, adopting, uh, foster care. All of these are examples of good works. So, so the deeds that follow the new nature, uh, good works, good deeds, they're not uh, limited, limited to any one thing in, in particular. Um, I mean, I regularly, and due to the fact that it is a part of the, the description of the work that I do, but I mean, I regularly visit, pray for the sick, comforting families in, in their time of distress, of course, giving, um, just to name a few. So those are all examples of, of good works. Okay, let's see, what do we have here? Um, Okay, Uh, my father for years has expressed his desire for divorce from my mom for various reasons and is completely stressed, even affecting his and my mom's health. 70 plus years old. Is it wrong that I rather them divorce if it saves their health and happiness or should I fight in prayer against the spirit of of division? Well... Here is, first off, the one good thing is that your opinion, um, or when you talk about what what should you pray for, because it's their union, it, it ultimately falls on them and not you. Um, listen, I get it because I've, I've counseled, Angel and I have counseled num- numerous couples where we want to say, please get a divorce, just, just get a divorce. And, and just and, and 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 let all things be peaceful, but but I can't do that. We can't do that. We can't even if in the natural that seems like that's the best course of action. Ultimately, it falls on them. So you can want it and and think that it's it's the best uh, route to take, but whether you prayed for it or not, that's not going to cause them to get a divorce. It's going to fall on them. Um, we should always be fighting in prayer for the spirit of division, but also we should be praying for the best outcome because the reality is if they're both believers in the Lord, they are the body of Christ. And Jesus did not come so that his body could be in disharmony. And God did not create the institution of marriage for the unhappiness and lack of welfare of mankind. So all of that has to be, all of that has to be considered. Um, you know, all I'm seeing here from your, from your question is that you have, you have a natural response and you have a spiritual response and that's normal. My loved one is suffering from allergies. Bottom line, can God heal them or is it natural? God can heal anyone from anything. So petition God, take that to God. And, I mean, how we've been taught faith, you, you got to stand. And having done all, stand. But aller- allergy, God's not limited in what he can heal. What aspect of the gifts of the Spirit is the holy laughter I've seen with Pastor Rodney Brown and Brother Hagen's ministries? What is its purpose? How can I tap into that? Uh, I guess being drunk in the Spirit. I I don't, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I, I praise God for, of course, praise God for, for Papa Hagen. I mean, he prophesied and he told my father I'd be a boy. I'd be the greatest blessing to him. 
Um, and so the gifts of the Spirit operating, the prophetic operating, legit. Uh, Pastor Brown also um, has been a blessing to the body. But I don't know if I can touch this one because I don't get it. I don't get it. I, it, it. Now, this is probably a very carnal and natural response. It looks and it sounds it's weird and creepy. It just does. Um, but that might be because I don't understand it. I don't get it. Now, do I see anything in Scripture? I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head anything. Well, for sure, not in the gifts of the Spirit. Um, I can't think of anything. I mean, we know there's laughter in the Bible, uh, but this holy laughter thing, I mean, I don't know. But I don't want to speak on something that could be an authentic move of the Spirit. So I've never experienced it. Uh, and like I said, from the outside looking in, it looks odd. But, hey, I mean, there are uh, occurrences within the body of Christ that seem to be odd. So uh, I'm not going to demonize it, that's for sure. Uh, but I... It has, based off what I see in the charismata in in First Corinthians twelve, the holy laughter has nothing to do with the gifts of the spirit. Pastor, uh, about what we will do in heaven, is it possible that we will still need teachers in New Jerusalem? Hmm. That's a good question, because it's already been established that. Healing will still be needed. So could other things that um, cause any kind of increase or progression, could, could that be uh, in need? Will that be needed in, in New Jerusalem? Um, heaven in New Jerusalem. I mean, I would love to be a history teacher for those who made it to heaven but did not study the word. I would have, I could have guest lectures like Moses and Abraham and you. And I, I, I you call on me all the time. I'd be right there. I'd love to do that. Um, see, and that's why. See, I would see. I would go. I'd learn about the cosmos so I could teach on the cosmos. I would love to do that. Uh, but I, I, I like. This question, is it possible that we still need teachers? Let's look at it like this. Is it possible that we're still learning and growing? I, I mean, there's nothing in the scripture that implies we're going to get to a place of, of infinity. Uh, light, we will live forever, but we're not God. So it would, it would seem we'd still be learning. And if we're still learning then would God privilege some to teach those who need to learn? I say sign me up. I like the sound of that. I hope so. Traveling and, and teaching. I'd love to do that. Question. Uh, a son tells their biological mother, Ah, since she is married to a woman. Ooh. <laughs> he cannot obey what his stepmother says because God does not honor this abomination. Anyway, is he being disobedient? Yeah, that's a loaded one. Because the biblical definition of marriage does not include this. And the Bible says obey your parents in the Lord. Um... But if, if the son can separate, because that's still your biological mother. And if what your mother is, is, oh, he cannot obey what his stepmother says, or supposed stepmother. Okay. Um, so, you know, honor, honor and, 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 and obedience, they, they are, they work they work in a unique way. So imagine authoritative figures that could be engaging in sinful behavior or abominations, uh, uh, workers of iniquity even. Do I still respect the badge? Do I still obey the judge? Do I still? I mean, technically the answer is yes. It's an authoritative figure. God is an authority God. So, so, 
I can. I can look at that union and say, that's, that's, that's not godly. Um, for sure, you would still honor your biological mother. Um, not obeying, but if the step, that doesn't even sound right. If the other woman is, is, isn't saying something that, that's in disharmony with the, <laughs> boy, it's like, it's like it's hard to work around the, the, it's hard to work around the, the supposed marital status here um but if the rules or whatever comes out of the mouth doesn't um go against the word of god even if the union is against the word of god um then one should still comply um if they're in a position to be removed from the house they should remove themselves that might just be the best course of action. But if an authoritative figure in my life um, tells me to do to do something that's not against the word, um, I have really no reason to disobey it. You know, like imagine, you know, imagine, you know, a, a police officer who's a who's a you know, let's just say a, a, a homosexual, you don't agree with homosexuality. I mean, and they're, they're bold about it. There's a, a rainbow and everything on their uniform. And then they tell you to do something. Do you say, well, I'm not obeying you because you engage in a, an abominable behavior. Like, no, that's not going to fly. So you, you kind of have to look at it that way. But I would, I would say, listen, if you can remove, if, if, if the son can remove themselves from that situation, that would be the best course of action. If they can't, well, obey what is of God in this situation until you are of age to remove yourself from that situation. Man, I, I don't think I've ever had a question like that. Goodness. That was a heavy one. Pastor, why do you think God allowed certain men to have multiple wives in the Old Testament? Uh, David, Solomon, does God consider multiple wives sinful today? Uh, he, well, when you talk about allowed, I mean, he allowed it all. Um, at a certain point, he did define what marriage was. A man should have a wife. Um... So why did he allow it? I mean, once again, he uh, he allowed what he's always allowed. And when we go back and we look at the life of David and Solomon, did any of that cause them any problems or issues? Yeah, it did. It did, so. Yeah, you don't want to um, remain in something because the the correction of God hasn't hit you immediately because you're going to look up and, and watch this and the consequence will come actually it will most likely come by the absence of God because his holy self can't touch or bless a, a disobedience not consistent and blatant disobedience so why would he create a universe that's ever expanding? Because he's God. I, yeah, he's God. Because <laughs> he didn't say stop expanding. Didn't tell light to stop, so. <sighs> okay, is that it? It's looking like that's it. So I'm gonna, it's 8.58 on my clock, so I'm gonna wait till nine if nothing else pops in. We'll close it out for tonight. Looks like the Miami Heat took game one. I wonder, 
Are these the four teams you all saw as the final four in the conference finals? I can't quite say. I. Golden State, yeah, kind of, kind of expected that, but the rest, kind of a surprise, but also not surprised. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say that is all for tonight. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you for uh, always the opportunities we have to get into the word, and I thank you that uh, those of us who remain where we are, those of us headed to our next destination, we make it there safely and timely. Your grace is upon us. You have given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, protecting us from all hurt, harm, and danger, lest we dash our feet against stones, because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And therefore, all satanic assignments set against us are canceled now, and we have ready to minister for us, we who are the heirs of salvation ministering spirits who heed the voice of your word in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And we'll see you Sunday.